Good morning, everybody. I hopefully won't uh, put you all to sleep with uh, the science section of this uh, morning's presentation. Um, I've been tasked to uh, introduce to you the uh, science behind palmitoyl ethanolamide PEA, and it's really a pleasure to do that. This is a molecule that I find extremely exciting. My lab has been working on this for over 20 years, and uh, I hope you will share my excitement by the time I am done with my, uh, with my talk. I think the best way to introduce PEA is just to remind ourselves of uh, the history behind this exciting molecule. Um, a history that actually starts a fairly long time ago in the 1940s when uh, during the war, when of course pharmaceuticals were scarce, it was discovered that egg yolk is an anti-inflammatory food. And that discovery brought scientists to ask the question, what chemical component of egg yolk is responsible for the anti-inflammatory effects? And scientists discovered that it was a lipid. So it was not the protein, it was not the, uh, the uh, sugars, but was rather the lipid component, which of course in egg yolk is very abundant, as you know. And uh, a few years later, in 1957, um, PEA, which at the time was a novel lipid, nobody had ever seen this uh, structure in nature, PEA was isolated from egg yolk and it was shown to possess at least some of the anti-inflammatory effects that people had ascribed to egg yolk. So not much happened after that. A few papers in the 1960s, uh, researchers continued to confirm the anti-inflammatory effect of, uh, of PEA. But I think the big moment was when, in the 1970s, between 73 and 78, in the then country of Czechoslovakia, which doesn't exist anymore, now it's called Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic, but in the country of Czechoslovakia, there was a company called PUFA, and they developed PEA for the treatment of influenza symptoms. They call it Impulsin. And uh, they ran a clinical trial with it. They actually ran a few clinical trials, and uh, this is the original paper uh, published in 1974 in the European Journal of Clinical Pharmacology. And what they discovered, I think, was really interesting. In fact, you know, Impulsin was, as a result of these studies, put on the market as an anti-influenza drug. But what they discovered that it was really effective, as you can see here, maybe those of you who are in the back won't be able to see it, but in reducing some of the symptoms like fever, headache, and sore throat a lot more than others, which are more uh, allergic symptoms like nasal stuffiness, discharge, and cough, but fever, headache, and sore throat were significantly reduced by impulsin. Unfortunately, I've not been able to find any technical data on this impulsin molecule. Uh, I don't speak Czech, and I don't read Czech either, so I would have to go there and find out. But it's an interesting, interesting study, which was, however, quickly forgotten. It was forgotten, of course, because we are in the post-Cold War period now. The Czech uh, Republic is born, the company disappears, and for no uh, known reason, Impulsin, PEA, also disappears. Now, meanwhile, back in the lab, people were starting to pay attention to PEA, and the discovery that I think really matters here was done in a lab at the NIH um, the, the lab by, of Sydney, Uden Friend, who may not mean anything to you, means a lot to me. He was a very famous uh, and accomplished investigator. And this, yeah, this man here, Nick Bachur, was responsible for a study where they looked for fatty acid ethanolamides like PEA in mammalian tissues. And what they found is indeed that the body of mammalians, uh, mammals, mammalian animals, produces. PEA. These are in this table. You, again, you won't probably be able to see it, but it shows the levels of the endogenous levels of PEA in a variety of tissues from rats, uh, the brain, the lung, the liver. And although the techniques back then were not very performing, um, they didn't have mass spec as we do now, they were essentially right in that PEA is indeed present normally in our body in fairly large concentrations. And in fact, the conclusion that came from this study was obviously that PA, people knew, is anti-inflammatory. Now the discovery was made that is produced by in, in our tissues. So 
turns out that PA is an endogenous anti-inflammatory compound. So that's an important discovery. Why is that important? Because when we think about inflammation for many, many years, we thought about inflammation as follows. We have a stimulus, which is a pro-inflammatory stimulus, and this pro-inflammatory stimulus causes the body to produce inflammatory molecules. Then the stimulus goes away, and the inflammatory molecules slowly go away. So whereas inflammation is seen as a positive response, as a response, as an active response, is always seen as a response that causes the formation of something that is harmful to the body, a pro-inflammatory compound. Instead, what we have here is something that works in an opposite direction, an anti-inflammatory compound. So that's a very novel idea. The problem is, how does it work? How does it work? And the first thought as to how it might work came actually from the work of uh, a person uh, whose photograph is here. Her name is Rita Levi-Montalcini, and uh, she received the Nobel Prize in 1986 for unrelated reasons. She discovered something called the nerve growth factors, which is a very, very important molecule in regulating the, the growth of, for example, sympathetic, uh, sympathetic neurons. And, you know, this is a picture of her. I have, I've met her and known her for many years when she was 102. A very, very healthy uh, young woman here. Anyway, so in the 1980s and early 1990s, Rita was working on mast cells because, also called mastocytes, mast cells, I'll tell you in a minute what they are, because she discovered that they make nerve growth factor, they make NGF. So she was working on these mast cells, and members of her lab came up with a possible explanation for what PEA might be doing. So these are the three people who I'm referring to. Of course, Rita is right here, and Luigi Aloa and Alberta Leon were the two co-workers who came up with this idea. So this is a mast cell. Look, this is the cell membrane. This is the nucleus. Do you see all these little sigma jiggers here? These vesicles are full of stuff. These are actually full of signaling molecules like serotonin, histamine, pro-inflammatory molecules. So when mast cells get stimulated, usually by antigens, what happens is that they release these pro-inflammatory molecules and causing inflammation, contributing to the inflammatory response, and particularly contributing to itch, pruritus, which is one of the things that mast cells do very, very well. So what Luigi Alberta and Rita Montalcini did, they thought, wait a minute, we have PEA in the body. Let's see what happens if we give PEA to mast cells in culture. And what they discovered is that PEA blocks the release of these inflammatory factors. So they came up with the idea that PA was an endogenous regulator of mast cell activity, and they called PA aliamide, where alia stands for autochoid local inflammation antagonism. It, it, the name doesn't really matter. The concept is that PA is a natural medicine. Autochoid means natural medicine. It's a natural medicine produced by the body to block mast cell activation. So it turns out that this idea is incorrect, but it put PA back on the map. However, unfortunately, this hypothesis also was quickly forgotten, just like the Czech study with Impulsin. So my lab became interested in this um, just by chance. In fact, we, uh, I, I was working with, uh, at the time with uh, Dr. Calignano. This is the, his photograph here. He's got more white hair than he did back then, but pretty much looks the same. Uh, and what we were interested in actually had nothing to do with PA. We were study, studying anandamide. Anandamide is a, an endogenous cannabinoid molecule. So it's a molecule that naturally mimics tetrahydrocannabinol or THC in the cannabis flowers and the cannabis leaves. And we make it, we make an anandamide. Animals make an anandamide, and the way an anandamide works, it activates cannabinoid receptors, just like THC does. And here is the structure of an anandamide is shown right here. And what it does, we discovered in this paper, it activates cannabinoid receptors in the skin, in peripheral tissues, 
And this activation causes a very profound analgesic response that does not require the spinal cord, does not require the brain. It happens even before the pain stimulus arrives in the spinal cord and the brain. So it's a peripheral pain killing response mediated by our own endocannabinoid anandamide. We were doing the studies and I said, we need a control for anandamide. We were seeing all these beautiful analgesic effects with anandamide and we wanted to make sure that we could find something that looked like an anandamide that didn't do the same thing. This is what scientists always do. We always try to find ways of uh, undercutting ourselves, right? It's called controls. And so we picked this guy here, palmitylethanolamide, and we picked it by chance because I didn't know much about this molecule, but you look, you know, this part, part portion here of the molecule is the same as this portion here. This portion here is a little bit similar to this. These are all carbon atoms, just in a, in, a, in a chain, right? This is 20 carbon atoms with four double bonds. This is 16 carbon atoms, no double bonds. So we picked this and we said it shouldn't do anything, right? Because it does not activate cannabinoid receptors. We knew PA did not activate cannabinoid receptors. But when we injected in animals, we started seeing profound analgesia. Profound analgesia that had nothing to do with the anti-inflammatory effects that we knew about but it was still very, very profound. And so we were, uh, were shocked by this and we started looking for a receptor. And initially, we, when we published this, we did not know what the receptor was. It looked like it can, could be a cannabinoid-like receptor, but we weren't sure. So we called it a cannabinoid-like receptor activated by PEA. Now, science has got a strange way of working because my lab at the time then became interested in another molecule. This guy here, oleoilethanolamide, you, 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 you see the refrain, palmitylethanolamide, oleoilethanolamide. Palmitil refers to the palmitic acid, oleoil to the oleic acid. And we became interested in, in oleoilethanolamide because we discovered that it regulates food intake. It is a profound anorexic if, uh, compound. It blocks food intake. In fact, it's got, now we know, 20, almost 15 years later, we know that it has very profound effects on cell metabolism. That's a different story. But when we made the discovery, we became interested in the receptor for this molecule here. And we discovered this receptor two years later. And we discovered that this receptor is a receptor called PPAR alpha, or PPAR alpha, which stands for peroxisome proliferated activate receptor type alpha. I'll tell you a few more things about this receptor in a moment. But when we discovered that PPAR alpha was mediating the effect of OEA, then we said to ourselves, look, this is the structure of OEA, right? If we take away this double bond and we take away this portion here of the molecule, we got PEA. So the two things look really similar. Is it possible that PEA acts just like OEA by activating PPAR alpha? And that is when a young uh, student joined my lab. His name is Jess Loverm. He's now at AbbVie. And I asked Jesse, let's try and test this idea. And sure enough, after a couple of, year, couple of years of work, part of his thesis, did an amazing thesis, uh, he discovered that in 2005, that the anti-inflammatory effects of PA, which had been known, as you know, since the 1950s, are entirely mediated by PPAR alpha. If you knock out PPAR alpha, the effects are gone. If you give a PPAR alpha mimic, the effects are replicated. If you use a PPAR alpha blocker, the effects are gone. So it really is entirely mediated by PPAR alpha. So at that point, we asked the question with Jess, well, if the anti-inflammatory effects are due to activation of PPAR alpha, maybe also the analgesic effects are due to activation of PPAR alpha. And that's what we discovered two years later we, we discovered that the entirety of the pharmacology of PEA, analgesic and anti-inflammatory, are mediated by this mysterious PPAR alpha nuclear receptor. So what is PPAR alpha? So here is a cell, and I called it a host defense cell. Host defense cells are cells in the body that are there to defend us against viruses, against uh, you know, bacteria, injury, and stuff like that. So in a cell like this, this is the cell nucleus, here is PPAR alpha. 
And normally PPR alpha sits in this portion of the cell, which is called the cytosol, outside the nucleus, right? And is bound to a protein called the heat shock protein. So when PA comes in, it binds to PPR alpha. And what happens is a couple of different things. The heat shock protein goes away, it sheds away, sheds off. And the receptor binds to this other receptor called RXR and this other series of, of, of proteins called co-activators. This particular protein here is called PGC1-alpha. And this complex here now goes into the cell nucleus, binds to the DNA, and regulates the expression of proteins, genes, and then therefore proteins that regulate inflammation. In fact, it causes reduced inflammation. Also, through a mechanism that probably is not completely sure yet, but probably does not involve the expression of proteins, it also reduces pain. So this is overall uh, way PPAR alpha works at the cellular level. But how does this regulate pain? So let me just briefly re remind you of how we feel pain. Okay, this is my friend Chuck, and he just got himself hurt here by, you know, he was playing with Black & Decker, and uh, he got himself a cut. So he's, pain, he's in pain, right? How does it work? So the, there are fibers here called nociceptive fibers. There are pain-sensing fibers that are everywhere in our body, outside on the skin and also inside in the, in the mucosae. So these cells become activated. The signal goes all the way up to the spinal cord, into the brain, and here is where we feel the pain, right? But I want you to pay attention to one particular station, one relay station on the way to the brain before the signal, the painful signal arrives in the spinal cord. There is a, a little uh, a bunch of neurons that are outside the spinal cord in a structure called the dorsal root ganglia. These are ganglia that are so little assemblage, uh, assemblages of neurons. They are located in a chain just by the side of our spinal cord. And in these neurons here, occurs the first processing of the pain signals. So the pain signal arrives, those neurons do a little bit of their electrical activity and they sense the, 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 pain, the pain signal into the spinal cord. So that's another look of the dorsal root ganglia, more schematic. This is the neuron, this is the cell body of the neuron, and these are the fibers. Here is where you feel pain, right? So that's where Chuck got his cut, right here. And then the other side goes to the spinal cord. This is called dorsal horn. And from here, it crosses over. It goes up to the brain. OK, that's the way the pain pathway works. This is the dorsal root ganglion. Now, these cells here have cannabinoid receptors, which are activated by our friend now, an anandamide. This is how an anandamide blocks the pain response. It activates CB1 receptors in these cells before the signal arrives to the spinal cord. But there is another group of cells here that are very, very important, and they're called the macrophages. Macrophages are cells of the innate immune system. And these macrophages, you see these red arrows here? It means that they release pro-algesic, so pain-inducing, and pro-inflammatory, inflammation-inducing compounds. And look, the macrophages, as well as the neurons, express PPAR alpha. And that's how we think PEA works by activating the PPAR alpha in these uh, macrophages and blocking the release of pro-inflammatory uh, pro signals, as well as in PPAR alpha in the neurons, blocking the activity of the cells. And here is a, just a slide to show you, a photograph to show you the localization of PPAR alpha in the dorsal root ganglia of mice that have PPAR alpha. And this is when we knock out, we remove genetically PPAR alpha through a process called the homologous, homologous recombination. We remove it, and the, you see the signal completely goes away. So this is PPAR alpha in the dorsal root ganglia. Now, I told you before, when we used to think about inflammation, we used to think about something that is induced by viruses, by bacteria, when they arrive into the body, we start producing molecules that are pro-inflammatory. But PA doesn't work that way. What, what happens is that PA is normally very high in healthy cells. There are many, many molecules of PA. We, we say macromolar levels of PA in the body. For example, in the skin, 
for example, in the DRGs, which are the dorsal root ganglion neurons, in the macrophages, a lot of PEA. What happens is that when a stimulus arrives, one of these pro-inflammatory stimuli I just mentioned, what happens is that the levels of PEA drop precipitously. They decrease. This is just to show you data. I don't want to just show you cartoons. This is a data from the lab, a piece of data from the lab. These are the levels of PEA in peripheral inflammatory cells. And if we give a compound called carrageenan, which is a pro-inflammatory stimulus, look, the levels of PEA drop precipitously. So PEA does not work like the rest of the, of the mediators of inflammation. It not, does not increase with inflammation. It decreases with inflammation. That's a very, very important thing. How does that exactly work? OK, here is how it, we think it works. In healthy tissues, there is a lot of PEA. And the enzyme that makes PEA is this enzyme here called NAEP PLD. And what this enzyme does, it cuts a, a lipid, a large lipid we have on our cells called NAEP. And then PEA can be converted by another enzyme, can be destroyed, deactivated by another enzyme called NA and AAA into this molecule here, palmitic acid. This is in healthy tissue, a lot of PEA. In inflammation and in, uh, in, uh, in painful states, look, PEA is much less. I told you that, right? Why? Well, because the enzyme that makes it, NAPLD, goes down. The expression of this enzyme, we say, the transcription is downregulated. And the expression of the enzyme that makes, the, that uh, destroys PEA, making palmitic acid, is increased. So it's a double whammy. The um, less production, more degradation, less PA. So who cares? We do. We should care. Because if inflammation and tissue damage lower PA production, then by replacing the PA that we have lost in inflammation, we will have an analgesic and anti-inflammatory effect. So administration of exogenous PA can offset this deficit. So we are giving a vitamin to a tissue that suffers from hypovitaminosis. That is a very important concept. It's not the same thing as giving a drug. It's restoring a normal level of an endogenous anti-inflammatory agent, an analgesic agent. So does it really work in humans? I only show you data from rats, mice, and, uh, and stuff like that. It does. In fact, uh, I'm not a clinical investigator, but I've been facilitating this by uh, the, the, you know, this very recent 2017 paper published by a group in Israel, a meta-analysis of the efficacy of PEA. These investigators looked back at the literature and asked the question, OK, how many studies, how many clinical studies we have on PEA? and compared the results, that's called a meta-analysis. And what they found, they found 10 studies, eight of which they were included in their report. I will spare you the gory details. I'll just go to quick conclusions. PEA, they concluded, may be a useful treatment for pain and is generally well tolerated. That's a very important initial, initial clinical uh, um, support uh, of the idea that PEA is an endogenous anti-analgesic uh, um, uh, and anti-inflammatory compound. Now, of course, the authors also conclude that more studies are needed, and that's clearly, uh, clearly always the case. So I would like to conclude, this is my last, oh, almost my last slide, I'd like to conclude by bringing in a, a very important concept, which is the difference between acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. So acute inflammation is the type of inflammation which we have Whenever our body is subjected to some kind of harmful stimulus, for example, a frostbite, for example, a cut, a little infection causes inflammation. It's a very protective response. We need inflammation. If we did not have an inflammation, we would die. That is acute inflammation. And usually acute inflammation is rarely treated, pharmacologically treated. I mean, if you have an allergic reaction, maybe you take an antihistamine. But in most cases for these things, unless they're very, very serious, you don't really go for a full treatment. I mean, maybe certainly an infection you do, but you typically don't treat the inflammation. For example, for an infection, you treat the infection, right? You take an antibiotic. You don't try and block the, the inflammation because the inflammation is a response to the, to the arrival of the bacteria, right? So this is something that also can happen in a lot of normal situations that are not really pathological. Uh, Venkatesh was referring before to what happens when you run, you know, if you're, a, if you're an athlete, 
and you run uh, or you, you know, exert your muscles excessively, then you have lactate, myoglobin release. Those are all things that, are, that uh, occur normally. They're not considered diseases. They're not pathological. Still, they can be harmful, right? Hurtful. So that's acute inflammation and is very useful in survival. What about chronic inflammation? This is where scientists are baffled. We do not know how an acute inflammation converts, transforms itself into a chronic inflammatory condition where there is no more reason for the body to be inflamed. There is no more reason for that. There are no bacteria, there are no viruses. It's just a process that is self-generating, self-regenerating process. And it's at the basis of almost every important disorder that we have. Cardiovascular disease, rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. These are huge conditions. And of course, cancer. So chronic inflammation is, I think Time Magazine once called it, the silent killer. Now, what does PEA do in this context? Well, what we know is that PEA, particularly in chronic inflammatory conditions, and this has been shown in human tissue, is lower. Just like I told you, just like I told you, the enzyme that makes it goes down, the enzyme that destroys it goes up, PA levels drop in allergic reactions, rheumatoid arthritis, and neurological diseases. And of course, we need more data, we need more conditions, we need to understand this better, but this is where we are right now. So if this is the case, what this suggests is that, of course, if we, therapeutic agents that for chronic inflammation should find ways of raising the levels of PEA, for example, PEA itself, or agents that raise it through some other mechanism. For example, my lab is interested in developing inhibitors for the enzyme that destroys PEA, and those inhibitors are very good at increasing the levels of PEA. But this is a drug. What about instead healthy living? And that's where I think you know, my colleagues at Levagen come with Levagen and GeneCore come in, 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 into play. What they're, what they're asking is the question is whether in conditions that are not yet pathological, PEA could be also effective. And they are show, they've just shown some very convincing data that this might be the case. So I, I will stop this by saying that, of course, we need more studies because this is despite the fact that 50 years, uh, PA was discovered more than 70 years ago, uh, actually, no, more, about 60 years ago in 57, um, we still need to understand in greater detail how it works in healthy people as well as in people with chronic inflammation or with chronic pain. Um, but the data we have so far are really encouraging. So I'd like to stop here and just as a disclosure say that my studies are supported by the National Institutes of Health and by the Department of Defense by and large. We also received a generous gift from GeneCorps and I'll stop here and take any questions if we have time. I think we do have some time.